I was very young and very naive and very spoiled, so that India was a shock to me. A lot of 22-year-old women would have been more sophisticated than I was. All the excesses of India always appealed to me. Here we are, we are with Wendy Donegal, and it's always wonderful to have her. She's written a new book, this time not necessarily about the myths, but in some way demystifying who Wendy Donegal is herself. So it's mm -hmm. called An American Girl in India. It's her letters that she wrote to her parents when she was 22 and spent one and a half years in India. And it is delightful. It's one of the most <laughs> wonderful, uplifting, incredibly interesting books I have read for a very long time. Uh, wow. So welcome, Wendy. Welcome to the week's Off the Shelf. And um, so, um, you know, I think that in a few, and I, you know, we were just talking about the book and I just wanted to say that you know, you never really find very many recollections of that period, which are written with such, you know, it, it was vividly described. I think you write about this, uh, you know, write to your parents and you're very close to them. But I think the 60s, if there is any description and a lot of now, um, you know, um, pioneer women economists, for example, have written and have written about that time, none of them really describe India in the 60s. We have a lot in the 40s and the 50s, but you know, the 60s kind of Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Uh, draws a blank. And I wanted to ask you about writing back to your parents, um, you know, coming to India at 22. Uh, what was that like? You know, uh, what was your first experience? So you, you, write, how, you write that at some point of time that India is not ex as exotic as you thought. It was, it's, a, it's a country you know. Um, so you, maybe you need to travel out. So can you talk really about writing about the book and how the book came about? And then we'll get in later. Well, that's a lot, a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very, I was younger than my 22 years. I was, um, a lot of 22 year old women would have been more sophisticated than I was in general. So I've been very pampered. I wrote to my parents, mommy and daddy. I call them dear mommy and daddy. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are, I wrote them everything. I, I was used to talking. So it's, it's a, in some ways, it's a childish book. There are a lot of references to literature, but a lot of them are to Alice in Wonderland and Winnie the Pooh yeah. and, and, ch and children's literature and so forth. So on the one hand, I was very young and very naive and very spoiled. So that India was a shock to me. In particular, uh, the poverty of India was a shock to me because the poverty of America was unknown to me. So mm -hmm. it was a double shock, it was another culture. At the same time, I've been reading about India for so long since I was really quite young. And I had images of what India was like and what the Indian people were like. So when I got out to the Bengal countryside at Shantini Ketan, and I saw little boys at sunset bringing home the cattle, it was like Krishna. I thought, I know this. I, I've read about this before. So some aspects, the sort of um, basic aspects, the things that don't change with time, um, you could have gone back 500 years, a thousand years, and it would have been those same little boys leading those cows. So that was the same. But then Calcutta was quite different. The um, modern um, atmosphere was different, the, um, the way Calcutta was. Um, so what was new was the, the trains. I remember the trains were so crowded once I went in the third class, I had to get through a window to get into my carriage. Mm. I had never done anything like that in my entire, somebody, somebody lifted me up, God knows who, someone lifted me up from behind. Very and much like me in and, so that was completely new. So a lot of it was new. And at the same time, I was always looking for the India that I'd been reading about the women in their saris and Shantini Kate, and you had women walking around washing their hair and playing yeah. the vina. And there was a sort of a almost cultural affectation of antiquity. Mm -hmm. So that satisfied me very much. So I was ricocheting back and forth between the modernity from, you know, 60s was mm -hmm. modern in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, on the one hand, there were rickshaws and I hated to, yeah. I wouldn't go in the rickshaw, the thought of being pulled. I know, there's, you mentioned an incident. It was very upsetting to me to have a human being do that. Yeah. On the yeah. other hand, the bicycle rickshaw seemed okay because I had ridden a bicycle too. Yeah. So the idea yeah. that a boy on a bicycle was pulling me, uh, that was okay, but that a human being on his bike, yeah. 
So I was sorting things out for myself all the whole yeah. time. And it was very exciting and uh, in some ways very exhausting. And it helped me to write. I was always a writer. I thought if I yes. get it down, you carried your paper, typewriter, right? Without it, I had my little Olivetti with me, yeah. and I had my parents with me in a way. I thought if I tell my mommy and daddy about it, it won't be so strange. I was like, yeah. you won't believe what I saw today. And then when I wrote it to them, I believed it. Yeah. I believed it more. Um, I never thought I would ever see those letters again. And yet at the same time, some of them are like field notes that I yeah. did expect to see again. So I don't really know what I thought would happen. What happened was that I lost the letters, that my mother kept them, that when she died in 1991, they came back to me, but there were so many, you know what happens when someone yeah. dies, yes. someone is prisoned to my mother. Yeah. So I never read them. Then in 2018, years later, when I retired and I had to give up my beautiful big office, there was this mm -hmm. box of letters. So I kind of suddenly met my, 22 yourself again when I was almost 80. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, it was it's, quite it's, a shock. That, that, you know, what's wonderful really about the book is, um, you know, while you're 22, and I think, um, I think there's a certain fresh eyed um, sort of, um, you know, there's that, there's a little bit of innocence. There's, you know, there's, there's that enthusiasm to sort of get onto the world, which of course you still have. You're, you know, you're incredibly enthusiastic and, you know, you're, you're probably younger than all of us put together when it comes to that. But there is that quality when you can only do it when you were, you know, when you were young. I mean, you spent one and a half years there. But I wanted to just back, uh, go back a little bit. Your relationship or your introduction to India and Sanskrit, which was really through your mother, um, in a way. Right? Everything tell us, through my mother. Yeah, <laughs> I owe it all to my mother. That, please? <laughs> Um, I owe it all to my mother. And in fact, my mother came to visit me when I was in India. Yeah. So your mother's the sitting there as all mothers saying, see, see what I told you, you, I was right. I kept your That's things right. carefully. She was always right. She yes. was always right. She came, she got off the plane in Madras, holding in her hand a New York salami. She held it on her hand all the way over. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so yes, I, I was, um, I was enthusiasm. I was enthusiastic about India from, a fairly young age because of my mother, who was a very literate woman. She, my mother never finished high school. There's a long story there. I wrote another book about her yeah. called mm. The Donegers of Great Neck about why yeah. my mother who was so brilliant, never finished high school. Um, but she read widely and she gave me a copy of A Passage to India, E.M. Foster. Yeah. And she gave me a copy of Rumor Garden's stories, Multiki and the stories from India. And then I read the Upanishads in what I now know is a terrible translation, but I thought mm -hmm. it was really wonderful. So I became interested in India as, as a girl, really, um, the way I was interested in, in Grimm's fairy tales and Hans Christian Andersen. I thought these were much better. So I already was into the storytelling traditions of India. Then in high school, I learned Latin and my Latin teacher was fresh out of teacher college, very enthusiastically, yeah. for no money at all, just in the evenings, just for the fun of it, taught me Greek, a little yeah. Greek. She taught me the Greek alphabet, yeah. you know, it was just the beginnings. But I love that the Greek alphabet was different from the Latin Roman yeah. alphabet. Yeah. And I love that. And she said, well, if you like that, you'd probably like Sanskrit. And I said, what is Sanskrit? And she said, that's the language of ancient India. And that was the, where all the stories came from. Yeah. So I became interested in that. Um, and then I, when I was time to go to college, I chose the one college where I could begin as a freshman, 17 years old, learning Sanskrit. That was a Ratcliffe, which was then the only way that women could go to Harvard and mm -hmm. Harvard taught Sanskrit. So, so I, I'd been studying India for quite a long time, really. I'd been studying it formally for five years and I'd been reading and thinking about it probably for 10 years, even though I was only 22. So I had already gotten to like um, a lot of aspects of Indian culture more than the one I was growing in. So I love, look what you're wearing now, right? You're wearing yeah. orange there and you're wearing green and uh, turquoise. So yeah. in America, you always wear black or gray. Yeah. And whenever I tried to wear, you know, a purple dress with an orange scarf, people say, what are you going to the circus or something? Mm -hmm. So you couldn't do that. And I loved Indian food. I loved that you could eat it with your fingers. I hated mm -hmm. knives. That's yeah. just great. You can eat like that. I liked 
the way Indian paintings had all sorts of things in them, lots and lots of figures and animals. And yeah. Whereas, you know, you have the Mona Lisa. I didn't like the Mona Lisa. It's just one woman sitting there. What's the point yeah. of that? Yeah. So <laughs> everything, all the excesses of India always appeal to me. And, and I wasn't disappointed when I was even more excess, excessive in real. I went to Kajurao. I went to um, the Kailasana at Alora, where you climb down in and the top of the top of the temple is at ground level. So it, it suited my, it has always and has continued to suit my temperament of the love of excess and of that's, detail and that's, so forth. It, you know, that's what is wonderful about the book. This, I also wanted to talk to you really about this. And you know, um, you have done in that one and a half years, firstly, I think it was very interesting that you came to Bengal. Um, can you still speak? Yes. I, I know you talk about your uh, this thing, so you could still you can still it's speak it's Bangla, it's right? It's a Bangla that's my pet line. Okay, I'm Bangla Bolte Pare. It's a Bangla Bolte Pare. It's a Bangla Bolte Pare. Yeah, which is which is which is my line that has got through got me through anywhere. Okay, absolutely. When you say the Anaba Daka Hobbing, Nishchoy Hobbing. Exactly. Okay, so you go to, you go to you go to Italy and you see or you somebody send you something and you say this and that's it. They've opened their heart and their mind and I can also do Amar Sonat Bangla for about one or two paras. So there, I've got it all set. Okay. But, when, I, know, when, I said, when, I, when I spoke Bengali, when I didn't know a word, I would put in the Sanskrit word pronounced with Bengali, or making the A's into O's. Yeah. But, but the kind of people I learned in, in uh, Bengal who spoke that kind of Sanskrit were people who were showing off sort of, you know, highfalutin <laughs> pseudo intellectual types. Yeah. So whenever I did that, whenever I spoke my Sanskrit in Bengali, my friends would say, look at the puro heat. There goes the puro heat. And that, that was a little joke that I was. So yeah, I, yeah. I never was really fluent in Bengali, but I, I, I could speak it and I could read it. I read Tagore. You also talk about, you know, you talk about, it's interesting that you go to Shanti Niketan and, you know, you talk about Tagore. And you said you were, you were, you read Tagore and, uh, but Shanti Niketan at that point of time was, was it, it must have been a really interesting time. It was before Shanti Niketan of today, very, very still, very much um, in within the vision of Tagore. So can you really talk about Shanti Niketan and in some ways a connection that you still have where, uh, where Tagore talks about, and you talk about this in a letter to your parents saying that, um, you know, the aspect of um, uh, the, power, the power of nature, essentially how man moves away from nature and you sort of, um, and, you know, that's really the most defining thing. And you, of course, have also talked really about um, the only kind of religion that you sort of are uh, connected to is this overpowering force of nature. Could you talk about that, please? Yes, well, it was, it was, it was very, it was a simpler place than it. I haven't visited it since then. I've just I been know. told what it's been like, so I haven't seen it since then. But it was a very simple place. Um, everything took place out of doors, and um, I was with women, so it was in the, I was in the women's hostel, there were no men, it was all right, and I was actually in the part of the hostel where they had people from other parts of the world as well, so I had a Thai, there was a girl who was called the Thai girl, but it was pronounced tiger, the Thai girl, I kept thinking, where is the tiger? tiger. They go, <laughs> the tiger. Um, and there were always women wearing, sorry, washing their hair, doing little paintings, sketches, and things like that. It was uh, playing instruments. Um, it was like you'd stepped back into a miniature painting of, of years ago. And it was indeed outdoors. And um, the Tagore poems that we sang in the morning were, Yo Devag Nao Yo Psu, the God who's in the fire, who is in the waters, Yo Vishwam Bhuvanam Avivesham, who, who pervades the whole universe, the God who's in the in the trees and in the grasses, to that God we bow. That was that was the the Upanishadic hymn that we mm. that we um, uh, sang really every morning, and it, it suited me. Um, it didn't inflict any theology on you. Um, it didn't inflict any dogma. Not that Hinduism ever inflicts any dogma on you, um, but it it was something one could slip into and say, yeah, I I can, I can go along with that. And in ways, even then, I wrote at one point to my parents that there was something limiting about a higher institution of education that was entirely dedicated to the thought of one man, genius mm. though he was, it was very, very Tagore-ish. Mm. Um, 
but uh, since he was quite wonderful and since it wasn't the whole, I, I, I liked it very much. I could see that it limited it in some ways, but I liked it. Yeah. And it, it's in my own nature. And the, it, the people there seemed happy with it. I met members of Tagore's family and I met the Roy's, Kshitish Roy, who was the mm. keeper of the papers and so forth. So it was a little sort of family industry in some ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was quite a family. So it, it, it was quite a family. Yeah. And, you know, um, you're right, Tagore was quite a genius, but also a snob. I remember he, um, I think there was this anecdote about him when he arrives. Um, in New York, um, and you know, somebody looks at his passport. He's just won the Nobel, and somebody looks at his passport and says, "Can you speak English?" And Tagore is aghast that somebody oh has asked him this goodness. question. And then what he is, and apparently sort of turns around and sort of sighs and says, "Oh my God, I'm not looking to be a word. Uh, You know, <laughs> um, it's it's such again a, such a Tagore it's such a Tagore anecdote. But I wanted to talk to you about also the other things. You know, you in your one and a half years have packed everything you learn how to dance Manipuri. Uh, yeah. You also go to Bharatnatyam uh, uh, classes with, of course, yep. uh, this you have, um, you uh, eat, of course, you know, you learn how to eat mangoes. I, um, can you tell us, um, uh, you know, you have this wonderful incident about uh, taking the mangoes across and then being stopped by, uh, by oh, at, at customs and then <laughs> opening it up and then eating it just to spite them. Um, so yeah, very much an Indian there. Um, but uh, well, I you know, did, she... I, you know, I, I was, a, you know, when you go to a foreign country, you find the things you know. So I was, oh, I was trained as a dancer. I was a ballet dancer before I, before I decided to give it up to do Sanskrit. So naturally, I learned dancing when I, I said, "Where are the dance classes?" When I yeah. got Eastern Indicate, and it was Manipuri dancing, which is much easier to learn than Bharatanatyam. It's it doesn't it doesn't strain the body as much as Bharatanatyam does. So that was what I really learned. Then when I went south, somehow or other, I got to meet Bala Sarasvati, and I was mm -hmm. able to sit in on one of her master classes. So I didn't really study with her. I really did study Manipuri. Um, but I sat and I saw Bala Sarasvati and I remember thinking how old she was. She was like 40 or something like that. But <laughs> she, was, she was a wonderful dancer. And then I had my wonderful friend Chanchal. For me, the heroine of my book is not myself, yeah. but it is Chanchal. Yeah. This um, high-spirited um, Punjabi girl who told me the most wonderful stories. And she told me that one of the ones I love best is that her father was a Sikh and was not supposed to drink. And she got him in trouble one day when she was in school and the teacher asked her to define the word, word neat. And she said, it means without ice. <laughs> so I, thought, I know, oh. I love that. So Chancho was, was really great. She, she was yeah. the, the, real, the real personality that I had. And Chancho was always telling me that everything was best in the Punjab. As I left India, gave me a dozen Punjabi mangoes. I took them on the plane. In, in those days, it took a long time. It was. It was jet, you had to change, you had to change, you had to change. Mm. And um, I ate six of them on the flight. That was the main thing I ate on the flight home. But then I arrived in, in New York um, with six mangoes left, six perfectly ripe Punjabi mangoes. And I was about to you know, go through customs and the passports and things. And then they said, well, you can't take those in because it's the food, pure food and drug act or something. You can't <laughs> take fruits into it. So I wasn't going to throw them away. So I just sat down. I took out a knife. In those days, you could take a knife on a plane. And everyone had left. And the, my own baggage was going round and round. And then just the one bag that was left. And the, and the officials were all looking at their watches because I was the only one left. And my parents were on the other side of the barrier waiting to welcome me home. And I ate those remaining six mangoes, <laughs> one after the other. And I was not going to throw away a Punjabi mango. That was, in a way, my, my last taste, literally my last taste of India before I went back into New York. So Chanchal was with me to the very end of my trip, really. So tr truly, uh, truly Indian then, you know, a, a Punjabi would never give up their mango. Uh, of but course. I also wanted to ask you, so you write, take back the sarod. Um, you meet uh, Ali, Akbar, uh, Ali Akbar Khan um, and you meet Ravi Shankar. I mean, I don't know anybody you didn't meet in the 60s, okay? Uh, so, <laughs> I met Germany um, Roy. I met Germany Roy. Roy, exactly. And at point of this, so I mean, and you know, I mean, 
it's wonderful because now he, of course, he's being rediscovered. And, you know, you write about that in the book where, um, you know, this aspect of it not being considered art. That's right, because it was just Krishna. It was just like yeah. folk painting, people yeah. thought. And it wasn't, of course. So I wrote a lot about it. I met him. I liked him so much. I bought a painting from him for $30, which I still have, a beautiful <laughs> painting. <laughs> Um, but I, but I, him. Him. I mean, brilliant. And, I, mean, yeah, and yeah. I talked to him about, uh, I wrote some of what he had said about the way he painted. The idea was that he was just doing folk art. Well, yeah. of course, now folk art itself is also much more valued than it yeah. was in those days. Earlier. True. Uh, but of course, he wasn't just doing folk art. He was taking yeah. these Indian themes and transforming them in a very sophisticated way in the light of what he'd learned from Picasso and Brock and a lot of other people mm. as well. But I did meet people. One met people in those days. Calcutta yeah. was a wonderful place. Ed Dimmick, who was the the, the family You're, that I stayed yeah, with, was yeah. the Dimmicks. He knew everybody. And mm. so he introduced me to everybody. But I also met people on trains all by myself who recited Shakespeare to me and all sorts of things. So um, they said I would. they would sing and then I would. I met a man on train. I sang a song. He sang a song. Then another guy sang a different song. We're all sitting there in the carriage doing it. So people were just open to me. I went to Calcutta. I, I, I had a friend. She said, stay with my family. It was a hot day. It was Cal and when I came in, the women were taking naps in a big dark room with fans going. And they said, come along. And I just lay down on the bed with all these strange women. We all just rolled up and went to sleep. Yeah. And it was just so nice. And I yeah. could not imagine that happening in any place I'd ever been in my life. Except. I, think, I think it's the same, but I think also, and I wanted to ask you these questions. That, you know, your 22 year old self, and you know, two things. I said, you know, at some point of time, you've chosen to keep the, you've chosen not to censor what your 22 year old has said which I think is an incredibly wonderful, brave decision you, you say, right? Talk. It was so really Robbie's, it was my publisher's decision, Robbie yes. Singh. When I read these letters, some of it was so stupid. I said, I, I'm gonna leave this out. He said, no, first of all, leave everything in, but also you need to apologize for the things that embarrass you now. In other words, to say, dear reader, you're gonna say, what? She said this, yeah. and I want you to know I said the same thing now yeah. when I read it. So it became part of a conversation which, we're having in America about reading old books that are racist and that use mm -hmm. words that we don't no longer use and that are anti-Semitic. And what do you do about good books that are written by people in a time when they, like everybody else, use racist and yeah. anti-Semitic language? And I think you read them and you say, look, even a good person like this had these bad ideas at the time. That's the way we all thought then. It weren't that we were all terrible then. It was the way we thought, and we've got to stop doing it now. It's not that it's okay because a great man was a racist. Ezra Pound was a fascist. No, mm. it was not that he was a very good poet. He was a fascist, but so so I I wrote in my preface to the letters and to each section, I now know how stupid this was. Um, so it's a conversation between a rather naive me and a slightly more sophisticated old lady me. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's important to have that conversation. It's interesting. I so even I, I told some stories. Like, this is a great story. And I tell the story yeah. of Saran. You, and I get it wrong. It's not why she became a horse. There's another reason. But I wrote a whole book about Saran yeah. later. And I got it right in the yeah. end. And it's, it's nice that I, I loved it from the start. I wrote it down fast. I wrote it down a little wrong. And I got a lot of other things wrong that I later got right. Um, the, the seeds of about seven or eight of my books are in those letters. This is an interesting story. How interesting it is that the gods behave so badly. So then I wrote a book called The Origins of Evil in mm. Hindu Mythology. Mm. Yeah. How wonderful Shiva is. I love Shiva. I wrote the book Shiva, the erotic ascetic. So you can see the seeds even in the mistakes, that it's something that interests me that I'm going to work on and, and get a little, get right later on, or at least get better later on. And I think it's interesting to see the mistakes as well as the things I, so, I got right. I think that's really the most wonderful part of it. I mean, I think that's bit, that is what is at the heart of a uh, you, 
as well as there is hope for scholarship. I think it's important for scholars or people listening to say, I was, I, I thought this, I, I thought, mean, this I, I thought one I I was differently to now. I mean, I think yeah. in this whole book world of cancel culture, we yes. don't allow people to change. We don't allow, right. allow the, we don't allow that at all. We don't allow the possibility of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Really so who didn't think like this? I mean, you couldn't have. And I mean, in the sense that 22 in a different missing, you always, there is a certain aspect of where you're learning. So there's, I think that's wonderful. I also want to- the language. I kept saying, it's, this is Western. Yeah. And so, so I said, no, I didn't mean Western. I mean, American, <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> or else I meant not Indian, but I- Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I have, yeah. so those, those words, one has to sort of put in parentheses, I meant this, I meant that, and so forth. So if you had to give, if you had to talk, get, tell your 22 year old self one life lesson that she didn't know at that point in time, what would that be? And what could your 22 year old self teach you, your 82 year old self now? Wow. What would I tell her about India in particular? Um, I would tell her that that kind of innocence um, was not going to last. Um, that kind of openness mm -hmm. to another culture was not going to last. That with the advent of television, with the rise of the RSS, with all sorts of things that happened in, in India, um, that the cultural openness was going to close down in various ways, mm -hmm. even as India was going to be bombarded with cultures in Calcutta, in, in Shanti Niketan, a lot of people had never seen an American before. Mm -hmm. um, so that was going to change. There were going to be lots of Americans coming to Shanti Niketan. So the fact that I was sort of a, a, a unique thing, come and meet the American girl, that was going to change forever. So on the one hand, you were going to get a lot more of the incursion of foreign culture. And at the same time, um, the move to preserve what it was uniquely Indian was going to go on in some in some centers. There were scholars and people were going to record the folk literature before the folk. There are people trying to catch now dialogues in India that only one person speaks. So that that Indianness was going to die out. I, I would I would warn her <laughs> that there was a that there was a moment in time that was not going to last. That this there was a a kind of um, respect for native culture in the villages, uh, in the countryside, and even in parts of the, of the city that was gonna be washed away with this wave of uh, access to Europe and, and to America in particular and all of that. That, that, that was a kind of innocence that was going to be lost. What would she tell me? She would tell me that people are still people <laughs> and that there are still villages. I have students who go into the villages. My friend Annie Gold goes to the villages in Rajasthan to this day. That's not all lost, that it still is valued by a lot of people and uh, it can be found. Uh, it's just, it's coated over with this difficult um, jingoistic, uh, layer but the, but the, it's still there i think it's still there i haven't been back to india for some time now but but i think it's still there <laughs> and thank you so much for being part of this thank you so uh, much read this book honestly it really is wonderful